I'd like to welcome you to our online presentation with International Expeditions. We're here to discover Cuba on the people-to-people -people journeys that are being offered by International Expeditions. And we're joined by Steve Cox, who is the Executive Director and one of the founders of International Expeditions. And I'm, I understand has been to Cuba now in the last year six or seven times. So he really knows the country well and uh, has some great stories. And I think we're all going to enjoy hearing more about uh, his experiences and how you might ex have some of the similar experiences as well. So Steve, welcome. We're happy to be with you this evening. Well, thanks, Lee, and thanks uh, for everyone for letting me uh, share time with you tonight and discuss Cuba. It's really a wonderful and interesting uh, place, and um, I think it's a place everyone would uh, really enjoy. So our agenda tonight is pretty much to first explain the legalities of licensed legal travel to Cuba, how you can go without worrying about it, what the laws uh, have changed that allow us to do it this way. And then I'm going to uh, go into some detail about the um, signature itinerary that we have, the one that uh, covers the country. It's different than just about any other American organization offers. And I think uh, that should be the one that we talk about because it'll give you a better overview of the the country and why you would want to go to some of these particular uh, places. So we'll show a lot of pictures and then we'll touch on um, as all the questions that you likely will have about um, about Cuba and traveling there, what the people are like, what the food is like, what are those accommodations like, how do we get there, and is it scary, and that sort of thing. And um, glad to do it. So here I am on one of those. Um, uh, Cuba trips. So my first exposure to Cuba was really back in the mid 70s with some US government and then later with state government. And then uh, IE is no stranger to Cuba. We actually began programming uh, there in 2003, but um, after 2000, at 2003, end of the year, it pretty much stopped <coughs> until just uh, last year, uh, unless you had a really specific type of license that allowed you to go for some purpose. I did go with our state several times. And then uh, last year, as Lee said, spent uh, quite a bit of the year there uh, after we got our license uh, approved. And our license approve, approval has been uh, renewed for two years because our government thought that we were doing it in the right way and should should be continued. So um, just for those who don't know us, I'll give you a very brief introduction to International Expeditions. We're 34 years old. We began as a conservation education uh, travel company uh, with programs around the world. We just were funding some of our projects through tourism. People think of us for Amazon, Galapagos, uh, East Africa, a lot of Central America. but Cuba is one of the one of our uh, major programs and something we're putting a lot of uh, work and effort uh, into. And of course, we're all all of us here at IE are very proud of our company and our associations with uh, all of our great travelers. So, um, as um, mentioned tonight, we're going to talk about a couple of different itineraries, but only one in detail. Our signature program is the one that we'll go into detail. But to let you know, we did um, introduce, are introducing a smaller, a more concentrated program with an emphasis on art, music, culture, with a uh, major focus in Havana, but also visiting some other areas of the uh, country. But we had so much um, inquiry for more focus on this and more time in Havana. Um, but our complete Cuba, our 10-day program, it covers the country. And um, it's one that uh, if you go on it, you'll know, you'll, you'll have a great, great overview of everything. So the, you hear, and you probably see advertised, the category of license called people to people. And that's what, what it is, a category of license. 
and what it really means is a is purposeful travel. It's educational travel, but without the requirements of working toward your toward a degree in a, a university higher education field. You can go for educational travel without that now, where used to you could not, and you had to stay nine weeks. So who was going to do that? So in order to qualify, you have to have um, a full agenda every day of meaningful interaction that is between us as American travelers and Cuban people, just regular Cuban people, not government people necessarily. And uh, it's not what we go and learn about Cuba, but really what we learn about Cuba and Cuban life, but also what the regular Cubans can learn um, from us about life in the uh, in the USA. So um, our license uh, has come from the uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is part of the Department of Treasury. And they're charged with enforcing and the uh, laws for the embargo. It, it's like trading with the enemy, I guess. Uh, and they, being Department of Treasury, they are most concerned with following your money from, from well, you all the way to Cuba. And nobody who does not have a license uh, can touch that money in between. And they follow it very strictly. So we're licensed to do that, but we have to give it to another entity that's licensed to actually put it in the hands of the Cubans. So they're keeping, our government is keeping track of it uh, all the way uh, through. And uh, we're providing you with all the documentation that uh, the law requires. Uh, we do all that heavy lifting. We provide the letters of authorization, the license copies, the uh, visa documentations, the tourist cards actually, everything. You just, all you have to do is just keep it in your records for five years after you come back, but we keep a, an original so we can always replace it. And because you're going legally, it means that we fly from Miami nonstop into Cuba. Uh, it means that there's no trouble on arrival in Cuba. They know and understand. We go through the interviews when we arrive ourselves for you. We have someone from our office that's always there uh, all the way through, as well as a, a Cuban guide. And because you're legal, when you come back into the USA, there's no trouble at all then with um, our own customs and immigration, because you wouldn't be on that airplane if you were not legal. You wouldn't be allowed on. So um, when we begin our trips, we start in um, Miami with an overnight there where everyone comes together at the Marriott and we discuss uh, the documentation. Everyone sees what what you need to have and hold on to, what every piece is, and then we uh, discuss the next day's events of, of what the air is going to be like, what it will be like when you arrive and return. And it takes the scariness out of it because we're there and have done this and we uh, walk everyone right on through. And I will say also that the flights from um, Miami to Cuba, check-in in, in the morning, has been in months ago and years, uh, just a zoo, just terrible. But um, uh, over the course of these uh, past months, we've got it down to where we can do a group check-in for everybody. You don't have to stand in line. All the bags go together. And uh, you can have breakfast while we're doing that, uh, all that heavy lifting. So it's uh, become actually quite uh, easy. When we begin our um, programs, we're flying then on this charter flight from Miami to the east central part of the country, either Camaway, the town of Camaway, or the town of Cienfuegos, depending on what day of the week it is. Uh, the planes are not. When you think charter, you think no, is that a small plane? Well, no. These are regular jets. They're provided by Delta Airlines or United or Continental occasionally or American um, others. So they are jets, generally 737s, and um, not small planes. The flight is very short, only really an hour or less, depending on where we're 
hitting. And then when we arrive, which will be um, in general uh, mid late mid morning, then we're we're ready to get started. And in Camelway, well, that might mean the uh, Camelway Ballet Company and seeing rehearsal, uh, understanding where they are. They're in an old colonial mansion and uh, very interesting just to um, see and hear and talk to them first, uh, first thing right off the bat. Now, of course, this trip, our, our, because we are natural history oriented, uh, the differences in our programs and besides us covering much more of the country is that we have a very uh, strong interest in nature and we we are putting that in the trip as you'll see as we go through but uh, we begin with the cultural aspects now Camelway is um, almost 500 years old as a colonial town very interesting we're walking through the um, streets and we're uh, seeing some old squares and such and having lunch and then we're moving to the Santa Spiritus province, the next province over, where we're spending our first night. The um, other days of the week, we may fly into Cienfuegos. And this town, also in East Central, is um, French. And it's a beautiful uh, town right on the uh, bay. So uh, one or the other. Camelway arrival, Cienfuegos arrival, and one night uh, upon arrival before we um, begin to move. And so we should have a map here where you could follow, but if you think east central moving a little bit west, we are then traveling into a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site which is, uh, translates to the uh, valley of the uh, sugar mills. And this is one of the areas that in old colonial times that, um, that it was just one after the other after the other of the sugar mills and sugar cane uh, growing all the way through there. So it's really, really beautiful um, landscape, beautiful uh, area. And the the people who owned the plant sugar plantations, they measured their wealth by the size both of their watchtowers, because the taller your watchtower, that means the more land you had to survey, or and also by the size of the bell, because the larger the bell meant the greater distance you needed to ring it in order to alert the workers who, which in those days were, of course, slaves. So we're seeing that before we're moving into the um, old, old colonial town of Trinidad. Now that is on the list of Americans who are studying Cuba. It's going to show up in so many of the uh, different guidebooks as, as just the best place you can go for the old colonial um, architecture and uh, and to see how uh, life was back in, the, in those days. Very colorful, very beautiful, 500 years old, as, as mentioned. So we are walking through Trinidad and uh, meeting people and talking all, all along um, the way in these squares. We're seeing some of the old homes that were mansions in those, those colonial days. And you know, it's just like, here's this house. It's uh, 450 years old and still has people in it. It's quite quite interesting. A beautiful church there, a cathedral that's um, uh, that we can go into. And interestingly, uh, you think, oh gosh, they just don't have religion in Cuba like they used to because it's communist, etc. Just a couple of weeks ago, in um, coming into Cienfuegos, going into a church where they were having mass. It was packed, just packed, and um, so it's uh, alive and well. But we walk through town, we um, visit people, uh, take part in various um, activities. Music is big for us in Cuba. Every lunch, every dinner, 
in every opportunity there's music of some type, uh, some place, all the way through. So we're having a little break here. This is a pottery is big in this uh, in this town, and this little small uh, cup is the traditional cup to have the traditional drink of Trinidad, which uh, is made up of uh, rum, of course, which rum is in everything you can imagine. They love to put it in there, but uh, lemon and honey and uh, a little a little. Uh, lime type juice, I guess. Visiting, um, as mentioned with people, this is like a fifth generation of, of uh, pottery. Now, um, this family, Santander, is, oh, goes back to Spain hundreds of years ago. And they've traditionally been potters. And there are a couple of other shops that are in Trinidad that are owned by the family. but. Um, most, they are mostly just uh, tourist shops with things for sale. But this one, what you're seeing here is practically all that, well, a little bit more that he has for, for sale. But we're going to see him because he's traditionally does it all by hand. And it's amazing what, uh, what, uh, he, what he can do and what his family does. So we're uh, meeting uh, people and visiting with them in every opportunity that we can in Trinidad. But Trinidad is um, not just, we're not there just because it's a beautiful colonial area. Our best day is actually ahead because we go into the mountains and, from Trinidad. And this is the location that, um, that you can reach there. It's, it's beautiful. It's very um, cool and pleasant up there. And we're meeting local people. And we're taking walks from a, um, a hacienda, uh, a farm area of, old, of coffee in the old days, but now is like a protected uh, park area. We'll go and have a welcome. Um, and then with our naturalist friends from, um, from the mountains who are just as accomplished as they can be, even though they've lived there all their lives, they love it. And every, they find things brand new all the time. The trail is not difficult. It's about an hour and a half. But this is how we get there. Um, this, a number of uh, Russian trucks owned by the Army and put into tourism. Now, it's bucket seats in the back. It's not that difficult to get there. There are seat belts. And we don't need it as much getting up into the mountains as we need it where we're going in those mountains, because it's uh, certainly off-road and as beautiful as it could uh, possibly be. And here's the first beginnings of, um, of endemic bird species that we see. And we see a, quite a large number of them. The national bird of Cuba, the trogon, Cuban trogon, they claim that reason it's the national bird is because it contains the colors of the um, Cuban flag, the red and the blue and the, the white. So this is our first uh, chance of, uh, of seeing that. So this is really a uh, wonderful uh, day in the mountains where we get uh, the day is not over, though, because uh, in the evening, we're going to our first private restaurant, the Paladar. This family, several families together, created a little courtyard in the back. And they're seafood uh, lovers. These are fishermen. This is on the coast. And what we have for dinner was swimming in the sea either the, that morning or the day before. So it's a great chance then to discuss um, private enterprise, which has come about in Cuba, and how they operate uh, their private restaurant. We move the next day after two nights in Trinidad. We move to the Bay of Pigs, uh, which is a gorgeous spot uh, in and of itself. There, our hotel is right on the beach, quite, quite pretty, and uh, was one of the uh, landing sites. Now, we don't say it too much in the itinerary, but we are stopping to in the Bay of Pigs Museum to get the take of that uh, invasion from the Cubans, from the Cuban standpoint, and uh, we're also meeting a um, naturalist who 
is uh, the director of the Zapata National Park, and those who um, wish, who are up for the walk, um, we go out there and we we um, go with him through uh, trails and areas along the edge of the swamp looking for um, birds and animals. Now, not showing you a picture of it, but, I'll, but one of our one of our goals is to see the smallest bird in the world, the Cuban uh, uh, bee hummingbird. And that little, it's kind of like a Jack Russell Terrier. He just thinks he's great big when he's actually tiny and afraid of nothing. And we, it's very, very rare. There are only a couple of places in the country. And we're meeting a local um, farmer slash environmentalist in a farm area with some farmers around, and he knows where that bee hummingbird is hanging out. And I would say that 80% of the time, maybe 85%, um, we're successful in um, finding him. Now, this is not the bee hummingbird, but this may be the most colorful bird that you'll see down there. He's a tiny guy, the Cuban toad is just fluffy and precious. So. In Bay of Pigs, um, we have that great natural history. We have historical perspectives that we get. We also um, have uh, a great cultural experience, maybe one of the best ones of the trip that we just stumbled on a year or two ago. It's a, it's a almost like a compound where artists from all over the country. Uh, go to, and there are like 60 or 80 of them. Some are musicians, some are modern dancers, some are um, theater people, artists, uh, all together where they, and it's not a school, they are there though refining their art, their music, their dance, their um, theater, and then they take it on the road to small towns, villages, uh, where that people there may not see much live uh, performance. And this is just astounding. And when, when, when we go, we're just dropping in on a rehearsal of some sort. And it could be anything. It's never been the same. But it's just uh, an amazing opportunity to be located in practically the middle of nowhere on the edges of the uh, Zapata Swamp. So quite a. Uh, quite a great find and one of the great uh, cultural things that we uh, do on that trip before we head west into what may be the most scenic area of the entire country. Now this is a view from a ridge above the Vinales Valley. Now the Vinales is where the best tobacco is grown for all those best uh, Cuban cigars and uh, these unusual rock formations, they call them mogotes, mogotes, they are actually limestone that, well, the mountain is caved in because of the real limestone. So you can see sheer rock and you get close, there's all kind of stalactites on the outside and there are rivers that run through the middle of them, uh, big, uh, big caves and quite, quite interesting. But we are not they are just for that. We're there to see um, the um, how tobacco is grown and the and visit the caves. We go to a private botanical garden on many occasions. But one of the best um, um, things that we do in that is that we came across about a year ago this time. We came across a um, farm project that was really good. So we're visiting a tobacco farmer, but the best farm visit is an organic farm. And Cubans are not that big on green vegetables in their own diet. They prefer meat and starches, and it would be nothing for a Cuban to just have them to be, have a big um, chunk of roast pork with some potatoes and rice. But here they're growing all kinds of great vegetables, very fresh, and the family uh, shows what they're doing, and then they um, give us a lunch that was just, just great. 
Um, so it was a wonderful, um, wonderful visit there. And in the same general region up in the mountains, uh, Saroa, where we're staying most of the time, most of our trips, spend two nights in those mountains, there's a wonderful garden, typically known for its orchids, but it's just got every kind of plant you can imagine, very well done, and we've become friends with the botanists there. They'll take us out on walks in the morning, and a great program within the orchid gardens. Uh, the national flower, the secret answer to this on the secret messages is that um, uh, young girls would take messages from the revolutionaries uh, fighting against for against the uh, Spanish in old colonial days, wrap them up, those tiny messages, slip them inside this flower, and the flower went in the lady's hair, and they just walk right on through relaying those messages. So that's what that's about. So when we leave the mountains, leave Soroa in the west, we head toward uh, Havana with our first visit uh, to Ernest Hemingway's uh, uh, farm and his home where we've got a specialist and others that uh, we talk to that show us all the way around it. Now, you, they have it such that you can see inside without walking inside, and this was Hemingway's home was left just as if he were going to be back in two weeks. He's still got magazines that he was reading. They dust these books every, uh, every week or 10 days. Uh, it, I mean, it's really just like he he left it. They love Hemingway there, and we see evidence of him, not just in his home, we see his boat, but also um, where he wrote some of his more famous uh, uh, works. He kept uh, an apartment for a long time, or a hotel room actually, in Old Havana because he wanted to be close to his uh, bars, favorite bars, and he would work, he would only write in the morning, and in the afternoon he would socialize. Uh, and some days he wouldn't ride at all because he would be uh, fishing. And his boat is there, it's been restored, and, and uh, you see it up, up uh, close. In Havana, we've got a lot to do, a lot to see, a lot of people to, uh, to visit. Um, it's almost, you see this old car, it's practically like you've stepped back 50 years in time. You think you're in the, in the uh, uh, twilight zone, as a matter of fact, uh, because the cars from 1959 and earlier are the ones that the regular guy people person is allowed to uh, have. When the revolution took place in 58-59, the way the law changed is that if you owned a car, you could keep it. You just couldn't get a new one. So you were pretty sure that you kept your car running and these old cars, Chevrolets are the most predominant. Um, and I think the 1951-52 uh, Chevrolets are probably the most uh, that you see. But all the way up, those great 57s, et cetera. And they're in great shape. Now, there might be a Toyota or a Isuzu engine in them, but they are in, in excellent shape. In old Havana, they are doing a great job in restoration work. This is this is going to be celebrating its 500-year-old anniversary here pretty, uh, pretty soon. And they began that restoration in the central part of Old Havana and are moving outwards. So there are a lot of great squares, a lot of um, art, artists, a lot of uh, workshops uh, going on, and uh, we're just doing uh, quite a bit. We became friends. One of our travelers did with... Um, a librarian in the Havana Public Library who needed, who just said, oh, we can't get enough children's books, and and they precious, so precious to have them, and so we've been bringing them all along. So that's just another little people-to-people -people kind of a thing. But uh, Havana's very scenic, and we have a couple of uh, really great days there where we're moving around on the inside and in the suburbs. A lot of walking um, uh, takes place. And uh, good pictures, those people who are photographers just have wonderful opportunity all the way around. But photography is certainly allowed. 
Uh, there are no real problems with that. Uh, it will be obvious things you probably shouldn't take photos of, but um, otherwise, they're very people are very much uh, very much welcome uh, the uh, ability to uh, come up to you and talk with you and have their picture made with you and that sort. Um, Museum of the Revolution. Oh, these actually are bullet holes where students attacked Batista, and these are. Uh, um, well, they just preserve those bullet holes as part of the, as part of it. So uh, a lot of great uh, history there. We're moving. Um, we're visiting a, a convent uh, that has a great social project uh, for for uh, people of all ages, including schools. The Balloon Convent is actually pretty famous in that it was um, the premier school not university, but uh, but school all through um, Cuba. The best education came there, and they still are operating that school. So we're, able, we're welcomed in and see what is um, happening at that moment, take advantage of it, and then uh, we're walking those streets of old Havana. So um, music, as mentioned, is an extremely important um, element of Cuban life. And uh, we have a great uh, evening one night in Havana. And then those who would like to be out a little bit later, um, the, there's a review at, uh, with people from Buena Vista Social Club. Now, Buena Vista Social Club, we've all heard of it, and very famously, but it's not a place. It's more of a group of people, of, of artists. Some of them uh, are back from 40 years ago, 50 years ago even. And uh, they became, well, famous again uh, a few years ago. So it's a, quite an enjoyable thing. It starts about 9.30. And uh, I'd say about half the people who will want to go there, and others may want to just uh, just uh, get an early night. So um, what we'll do at this point, um, after a couple of nights in uh, Havana, we're flying back to uh, Miami after those 10 days. But I, it kind of gives me a, a lead in to go into some of the things that, that you'll probably want to ask about. And you may be asking uh, Charlie in uh, the question box here. but. What the food is like is um, is a main thing because a lot of times people hear, well, it's really not very good and or it's very bland or whatever. Well, it's not spicy food. Cubans don't go into spiciness, so you need to take your own hot sauce if you're if you uh, like that. But it could be bland, but we don't let it be because we've selected different restaurants. We're not eating in hotels all the time. We've we're going to different restaurants that have some specialty, something different, something atmospheric about it. Um, and the food then is, um, is actually good, not bad at all, as, as people would, would, uh, might wonder. Generally speaking, on regular days, lunches, etc., you're going to get choices. And uh, most commonly, it's going to be for an entree, well, would you like uh, something with pork? Would you like something with chicken? Would you like something with fish? And what they do with that and how we make the variety uh, can make all the difference in the world. Uh, beef is not a, a part of the Cuban diet because it's so so rare, but some of the nice restaurants uh, have it. And you will find that on the menu a few uh, times along the way. Uh, we're getting as many vegetables in as we can. There's always a, a soup or a salad, appetizer, always a great dessert. Uh, when you're having lunches and dinners, you'll have your choice of uh, a couple of uh, drinks, and those drinks might be uh, soft drinks similar to Coca-Cola and Sprite and orange and et cetera, or beer. There. They have two beers there. One is a little bit darker, called Bucanero. The other is a little lighter, Cristal. 
and uh, very good. Uh, not, I think I don't think it's that potent, and and uh, a lot of people really like it. A glass of wine could be a part of it, but generally, they, or water, either regular water in bottles or um, plain or with gas, a little fizzy water. So there's plenty of that. Now we're speaking of water. Even though you might be able to, it's um, it's not a good idea to drink water out of the tap anywhere practically in, anymore other than the USA. But we're providing bottled water throughout. We have it on the coat, on the bus all the time. You just get some, take it up to your room. It's all provided. It's you know no charge to that at all. So that keeps you hydrated uh, uh, throughout. The um, accommodations, uh, people will ask about that. What are they like? And we have a variety. We have a gorgeous, modern, new hotel in Havana that's uh, glass, a lot of glass, big lobby, uh, an international standard hotel there. But when we're out in the countryside, we have a, quite a variety. And some of those hotels are a little bit quirky. Uh, they all are air conditioned, all with private bath, all are clean. Uh, the staff tries very hard. Uh, but sometimes it's the only where we are, like on the Bay of Pigs. Uh, Playa Larga, it's the only thing there, but the room is huge, and we know the rooms where all the water pressure is good, and um, and uh, the air conditioning has been, uh, well, for the most part, worked very well, and if we ever run across one that doesn't, we trade uh, the rooms. But the, the hotels are okay in the countryside, and I think a lot of people are expecting them to be uh, rough or difficult, but uh, are very pleasantly surprised when you see how how pleasant they are. Um, sometimes the hotels, like in Trinidad, can be assigned, uh, but in general, we're on the beaches of Trinidad, or we're up in the mountains above, and both are great locations to be. So the the hotels are are all okay. As mentioned, they're clean, they're comfortable private bath, hot water works, and the air conditioning uh, works. So nothing to be, nothing to be uh, afraid of there um, at all. Um, you have, you're going to be comfortable there too. It's very safe. There's not a, a feeling of dread or that, that you shouldn't be walking out here. It's, it's one of the more safe countries that you could uh, ever visit. And the people are very, uh, Friendly, very welcoming to us as Americans. They uh, may come to you and ask if you know one of their relatives. Who inevitably they will have relatives in the USA someplace. You might be from Chicago, but they wonder if you know their relative in San Diego, as example. Um, English is taught there. It and uh, people would love to practice their language. We're not shy about talking with them at all, and uh, we engage with them even if it's on on a, a park bench and uh, have no uh, qualms about that um, whatsoever. I know there are going to be a lot of questions that uh, you probably put in, in there. I'll just uh, tell you that this past year we operated quite a number of trips down there on this program that I just uh, uh, told you about. You see the departure dates that we have on those uh, 10 days. It's the one that covers the country. Uh, there's not another company in the U.S. that has quite the same itinerary, quite this broad a reach. Uh, and it's a complex itinerary. We're doing a lot, seeing a lot, going a lot of different places. Uh, and we're not afraid of that. Uh, some others, other um, programs you may see concentrate in Havana, as we're going to do with our art and culture. There's nothing wrong with that at all, but you just don't see the real Cuba in all its beauty and complexity by staying in Havana and maybe getting out once or twice. But we're not afraid of the complexity of it because we've made very good contacts and we've done it for quite a while, and um, uh, there's uh, people love this trip. And they're glad that they uh, that they did it this way. 
So I uh, would encourage you to um, think about it and call me with any kind of questions that you may uh, have about the program. My direct dial number is probably on here somewhere, or you can email me um, here at the last slide. We'll show that, and um, and you'll see. So we're the times that you see we're going uh, from beginning of November uh, through uh, the next year uh, are all very good um, times. We're not going in the hurricane season. Uh, it might this year would have been perfectly fine. There's not been one, but you know you just don't know. And uh, from November, December, January, February, March, April, even May and early June, these are uh, good times to be there. Uh, weather is, is uh, quite good, and um, we encourage you to um, uh, to go. Now, our uh, art and culture, the more Havana-centric, uh, we're doing just several of those throughout the year. But this is the perfect thing for, uh, for a lot of people who uh, maybe don't have quite as much um, interest in nature or um, or who really just want to know more about the art because art is such an important uh, thing in Cuban uh, culture as is music and we're moving heavy heavy into uh, into that plus we're getting out on some day trips and going down to uh, to Trinidad as well uh, for that visit so with um, with that, I'll give you some uh, contact info, and then I'm going to let Lee um, come back to me with Charlie's uh, questions about um, things that I may not have covered with you. There's a world of topics we could go into. What is the currency like? What can you bring back? Things like that. So, uh, Lee, is that? Can I give it back to you now for those questions? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Steve. And Charlie has been very busy answering questions. There are some that uh, have come up more than once, and so we will jump into those. Um, there's questions about whether the water is safe to drink and whether it's safe to eat salad there. Okay. Well, I'm, I can answer that. Uh, the water, you have bottled water that we're providing for you, and so use it, and then you have no question about it. Uh, if you slip up and you brush your teeth with tap water, nothing likely is going to happen. But um, you know, some people have reactions just within our own country going to another city. So just just use the bottled water. It's ample. We're never going to run out of it, and um, and you are replenish every day. Uh, as far as eating uh, the food and the salads, not a problem. Now uh, they are not big on, um, as mentioned, green vegetables. And salads have, has a pretty wide variety of what does that mean. Oftentimes, it's, it's whatever they have growing. And sometimes it may consist of cucumbers and tomatoes. Sometimes it's shredded cabbage. Sometimes it's never a salad like we think of with a great big Caesar salad or something like that. It's more of an appetizer. and uh, <clears throat> And we've had no no problems with it. Um, I don't think anybody in last month uh, was even uh, even queasy, as as I recall. And um, uh, so I think that would be a pleasant surprise. You're not when you go, you're not guaranteed to uh, get sick at all. Oh, that's good. Uh, another uh, common question was how large the groups are that you're taking. Oh, well, good question. Oh, and that will lead me into the vehicles, too. Uh, we don't like to go with big numbers. Um, you may find some other companies that would be large numbers, but uh, look to us for the 14, 16, 18, maybe, something to that effect. Uh, the vehicles that we're on uh, are new or new-ish. They are Chinese-built. And depending on the size of our group, the vehicle that we're in is always a vehicle size larger than we need so that you have plenty of, uh, plenty of room. And those vehicles come in sizes that are 16, 24, I think 32, and maybe 40 
42 or 44 uh, passenger sizes. Some of the larger ones, the great big buses, which, you know, I mean, we have been on before, even though everybody could have a seat of their own. While well, they even have a restroom in the back, and they all have uh, DVD players and screens up there, so they're very uh, they're very good vehicles. On uh, they purchased a huge number of them from China, and um, that's what we're on. Oh, okay. Except for very that good. Russian truck. <laughs> <laughs> so um, people are also interested in um, whether they will have internet and whether the electrical plug-ins would be the same um, as they would be in the U.S.? Well, um, the electrical plugs, plugs can be anything. In your hotel, you could have one of varying types. You can have some that are round prong, some that's 220, some that are 110. So you just never know one to the other. In Havana, it's everything in your room. Um, hair dryers have started showing up more, and they work. But some quirky hotels, there might be a phone in the in your room, and then you look and you think, well, that phone's not plugged into anything, but there is a phone in the room. So um, um, it's um, you should not have a problem with the electrical current and what you've got to uh, charge. Now, you will have a little bit of difficulty with internet there because they're not on our internet, and you know you can't take your own cell phone down there or connect the internet on your own uh, devices. They, their brand of, of um, internet, whether it's wireless or, or whatever, is kind of local and is very slow. So just don't count, and you can go to a hotel and go to the lobby, they'll have a computer in there, and you can pay, I don't know, eight or ten dollars, equivalent of eight or ten dollars in their currency, for maybe an hour of time, but you may only check, you might only can check three e and reply to three emails in an hour's time because it's very slow. You can call home from there, um, from the hotel, and you can receive uh, calls, but you may have to do it from the lobby. But we'll have, our guide will have a cell phone, and we're always reachable, and we they can always reach out. So there's uh, not... Uh, a communication problem, but don't, you know, figure that you're going to be able to go and do work or check your stocks or anything like that because uh, on a regular basis because it's just not that way. <laughs> well, that's good to know. And you mentioned um, currency there, and there are some questions about currency, the exchange rate, and how one goes about getting getting local currency, and so maybe we can touch on that. Yes, well, it's uh, complicated in one sense, but very simple in another. First thing is your credit cards will not work down there. They're no good. Uh, checks are no good. You will need to go with cash. You won't need a lot of cash uh, at all unless you are intending on buying very good, expensive art or something to bring back. But what but Cuba has two currencies. They have a national peso that the local people are paid their salaries in, and it's not worth much. Uh, you'll see on the trip, we'll go into the shops where people can spend that national currency, and, you'll, and basically it's just a ration card distribution center. But the currency that you change your money into is called a Cuban convertible peso, the CUC. And um, if you give $100 U.S., you're going to get, after they do their taxes and that exchange, which is artificial, you're going to get back about 87 uh, Cuban convertible pesos. And then at that point, you kind of look and they try to make things the equivalent of one Cuban peso to a dollar as far as what things are, look like they ought to be uh, worth. But you can change those in places all across the country, and that exchange rate's going to be the same, whether it's a bank or, or one of the exchange bureaus they call Cadecas. It's going to be the same. And, um, and there are places all along the way that uh, you can do it. There's no need to change a whole bunch at once. Um, you can do some all along, and 
the expedition leader and guides can, can give you that uh, guidance on that. But then when you're finished with the trip at the airport, you can change it back, whatever you have left over, into U.S. dollars on a one-to-one -one basis so you don't get hammered with it one more time. It's That currency is no good outside of uh, Cuba except for souvenir value, I suppose. But um, we, unless you know, and I've been with people, not on our trips, but with with government trips where they just, these people were going down with $10,000 to buy uh, really upscale art, but if you're not into that, then you probably would be fine with you know, $750 and come back with plenty of change because you really don't need a huge amount down there other than maybe tips to the guides and uh, you can buy plenty of uh, cigars and rum and such as that and spend money on it, but you just consume it while in Cuba because they, um, our government doesn't let you bring it back. And they will uh, get it if they can in uh, Miami. But generally speaking, because we're legal uh, and Americans on programs like this, they know we follow the rules and we're not very efficient uh, targets in so they kind of wave us through. I rarely, I only saw one time where anybody was even asked anything. Uh, you're just practically walking through our own government uh, customs uh, when we get back home. Well, that's good. So uh, you talked about what things have to be consumed, you know, and that you can purchase, but you have to consume before you leave the country. And there are a lot of people who are interested to know what sort of things they could bring home with them, what sort of souvenir things. Um, artwork, you mentioned that. What else might be okay? Well, I, I just saw, and uh, in fact, just yesterday, the reason behind this thinking um, of what our government allows you to bring back and the way they say it is that you can bring back informational material. And that informational material has been expanded to include things that are of an artistic ex um, uh, exploration, which is art, which is, well, of course, literature, naturally, but uh, sculptures, uh, it, it, anything made and that would be kind of like handicrafts, things of artistic um, expression are considered informational and okay to bring back. Um, those consumable things are not, though. That's why the rums and, rum and cigar won't. But generally speaking, the things you would get are more um, souvenir items. They're not anything valuable or important. And... Um, uh, they just don't seem to care that much about it in Miami, whereas I think it's making it a point to not uh, let you bring back the uh, rum and the cigars because that's just traditional of Cuba, and uh, they're just not going to have that. But you come back with things to give to family and friends, whether they're carvings or T-shirts or hats and such as that. That's uh, just not an issue to to our, our government. It's not, not mm -hmm. worth worrying about. I believe. Yeah. Okay. Very There's good. Great, great art there of all types, inexpensive and expensive if you want to, it to be that way. Okay. Good. Steve, let me turn it back over to you now for anything else you'd like to share before we go. Well, I will just will say that it's um, if you've ever thought about going uh, and you wanted to go, this is really the way uh, to do it. We don't, you know, you could have done this 10 years ago, but then for 10 years you couldn't. And you just don't know what, you know, another year will bring or two years will bring. If it opens wide open, that's also kind of difficult because the infrastructure, there's just not enough hotels, there's not a it can't handle it. So therefore, the Cubans will have to limit it, I'm afraid. But it could be that our government shuts it off, too. We just don't know. So I, I would not want you to think, oh, well, I'll wait a couple of years. It'll get better or whatever, because um, you just don't know that. And I do know that it's a lot of fun. It's enjoyable. You learn a lot. Um, it's a great variety. Uh, 
some of everything, including the nature aspect of it. And who wouldn't like to see the smallest bird in the world? Just a, a, a great uh, thing. And our program, I, I, I'm not even guessing. I'm certain that it is the most complete that exists from any American uh, um, organization. And our government has rewarded us with what we're doing, because we are very uh, much followers of, of the law and the rules, both in letter and spirit. So we know we're not going to have uh, uh, anybody in any kind of uh, trouble for doing or saying or acting the wrong way. And it's, it's uh, a much uh, easier time for you. And we handle all the, the heavy lifting, so it's not a, not a bit of worry. So we welcome you to go. I'm welcoming you to um, call or email anytime. I can, as you can probably tell, I can talk on it for on and on and on until somebody just says, please, please be quiet. <laughs> and um, uh, I guess I'll leave it uh, at that. With that, we'll say good evening and conclude our webinar. Goodbye now. <laughs>